All right, we're returning this morning to Ecclesiastes 3, so you can find your place in Ecclesiastes 3. We're going to go back and read verses 1 through 15 again. I want to finish up this section this morning so we can, next Sunday, we can go to the final half of chapter 3. While you're turning there, I want to show you a couple of studies that we're starting this Wednesday night for adults. We have studies for all age groups beginning this Wednesday night. Um, one of the studies is a study of 1 Corinthians. That class for adults will be meeting in here, and I'll start the study of 1 Corinthians this Wednesday night. And then the other um, study for adults will be the book of James, about faith and how faith works. And that'll be in one of those classrooms, the first classroom right outside this door. They're marked, the, uh, the studies are put on the outside the door so you'll know where to go. So, look, um, some fortunate person this morning is going to get a free copy of this. So who will join me this Wednesday night in a study of 1 Corinthians? Oh, Rebecca, you get this copy. And you're going to have to walk up here and get it. And then who, who's going to join the second group in a study of the book of James this Wednesday night? Soka, is that a, oh, there's a hand back there. I thought Soka was putting in a bid this morning for it. But. All right, brother, you got, you got your copy. Now, the rest of you can pick up your copies of that outside on the table as you leave this morning. We'd hope you'll join us. It's, uh, the fall study is only six uh, weeks of study every other Wednesday night. So we have a, a lot of material to cover. We're not going to, of course, finish in our class. We're not going to finish this, uh, 1 Corinthians in six weeks, but we'll pick it up after the holiday break. So I'm really looking forward to this study. I've been uh, restudying 1 Corinthians for several weeks now and have really enjoyed it. And I think you'll profit at that. And, and I have preached through James. I know you will enjoy a study of James. That will be led by Patrick Aldinger and Josh Parker. And I think maybe someone else will be pitching in and helping facilitate that study. So dinner's at 6 and 6.50. Uh, we'll join for our small group classes. And at uh, 7.45, we'll conclude so you can be home, flossed, and got to get the kids in bed by 8 o'clock. That's our plan. Starts this Wednesday night. Hope you'll join us. Now, let's go back and look at verses 1 through 15. Let me read these verses. Follow along with me. I'm reading now the English Standard Version. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Time to plant and a time to pluck, what, pluck up what is planted. Time to kill and a time to heal. Time to break down and a time to build up. Time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What, God has, what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of men to busy with. He has made everything in its time. And he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Again, that's the, here's the second refrain of six refrains in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he's repeated this already, or he said this already in chapter 2. There is nothing better for them or for man than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his work or toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. 
Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so that people fear before Him. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Now, last Sunday, I mentioned there were three really fundamental lessons that I wanted to capture out of chapter 3. And for those of you who were out last week, uh, let me review these with you. They'll come up on the screen. The first thing, we talked about this briefly last Sunday. In light of this, that is the sovereignty of God over all things in our life, we should embrace the beauty of God's comprehensive control of all things. I told you last week, uh, in reality, there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as chance. God is in control of all things. Secondly, we'll look at this, number two and three, uh, more deeply this morning. Under the reality of God's sovereignty, we should be holy and happy. That's what Solomon says to us this morning. Under the reality that God is in control of all things, it should become the basis of our holiness and the basis of joy, joyful living in our lives. Number three, because of God's enduring, complete, and just providence, we should fear God. So let's look at these this morning. We'll be rather brief because we have communion so stay with me as we run through these. I want to look at the first one again briefly this morning because I want to share something I didn't mention last Sunday. That the first one then is again, should, we should embrace the beauty of God's comprehensive control of all things. Now here's what I didn't mention. We notice in our reading, the first eight verses of chapter two or three, Solomon doesn't mention God. But we can be sure that he has God on his mind because he's talking about time. And in the second section, verses 9 through 15, Solomon shifts, if you will, the focus to God. Here in these verses, he mentions God no less than eight times. Now, we take these verses together, and of course, we can understand that Solomon believes, as we should believe, that it is God who orchestrates all of time. But that is, history is his story. And we've been blessed to be part of that history. So in verses 9 through 15, Solomon sets God before us. And I think the purpose of seeing or doing that is so that we might have a heavenly perspective of time on this earth. The purpose of seeing, see, from this perspective is that we might see how God sees time. Now that's important because historically, if you've read some of the ancient writers and you've read much of the pagan religions during the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, you'll know that the pagans had a circular view of history. It's just, history would just repeat itself over and over again. And man was just destined to be caught up in that circle at a particular time. But when Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to teach, we realize that God has, and Christianity has what we would say, a linear view of history. Now this is important for us because it helps us to understand some wonderful truths about our lives that we wrestle with. So let's, let's think of now God's linear view and the Christian's linear view of history. Say from that wall there all the way over to this wall would be the linear view of what we know as history. Or man's time from creation to Christ's return. All right? Well, God, who is, of course, sovereign and sees all things, he's looking at all of history set before him. And he sees, at the same time, every aspect, every point in his story that he has written that we're a part of. 
So that means, let's take Bill Munka, for example. God knew before Bill Munka's body was ever formed in his mother's womb, God knew. He knew, before knew Bill Munka. And God can see right now, he sees the moment Bill Munka's mother gave birth to Bill. God also can see at the same time how in, I can't remember the date, Bill, I might get this wrong, but let's say 2015, Bill Munka gave his heart. He trusted in Christ and was born again. God sees that. At the same time, he sees Bill Munka's natural birth. He sees his spiritual birth. But he also can see Bill Munka at the end where he's going to be ultimately glorified. He sees all that. So when God thinks of Bill Munka or Richard Hall or, or Redigo Phillips, you know how God sees us? As just men made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, he, he can see this part where we were in our sin and in rebellion against God. But he sees us in our glorified state. He relates to us in that way. Now, we, have str we struggle with that. I do. I mean, I know how in this present point in my life, God sees all things. I struggle with all kinds of temptations and even sin. And then yet God says, I have the privilege to enter into his throne room and have communion with him and talk with him. Why? God sees us through the finished work of Christ. That sin has been paid for. It, the sin, I, all my sin, even that sin that I'll commit, in the future, that sin had been, has been imputed to Christ. And Christ paid for it. So, there's no condemnation for me. Now, I might face discipline. And uh, Glenda might have to punish Bill for being a bad guy. You know, discipline him. God might use Glenda to do that. We do. <laughs> Depends on next week. I think you've been pretty good so far. Uh, today, that is. But we do. God loves us, and he disciplines those whom he loves. But yet, he sees us in our glorified state. Because our sins have been imputed to Christ. We've been made righteous before him. Now, guys, I can't completely, I can't completely get all that in my head. You know, but it's the truth. It's what the Bible teaches. And that should help us as we live our lives. That's a, this, a linear view of history. It doesn't always make sense, does it? You know, I, I can't explain why God allowed that boat out on the California coast with those divers on it to go up in flames and 34 people lost their lives. By the way, did you know one of those was from Germantown? One of those men was from Germantown, was right up north of us. We may, may have run across him in our lives. One day didn't even know it. I don't understand that. But don't tell me that God was asleep at the wheel. And that happened by bad luck. I'm saying that according to what Ecclesiastes teaches us, that God is in control of all things. You know, we look at our lives. We can't explain the things that are happening. Sometimes the pic picture is not clear. I... I I liken it to like trying to shave in front of a foggy mirror. It's hard, almost impossible sometimes to understand the ways of God. But we do need to trust Him. Some years ago, I used this illustration way back when I was at a Grace Evangelical Church. I first used this illustration of watching my aunt do cross-stitching. And I thought, you know, when I... When I used that illustration, I thought, man, this is genius. What a great illustration. And it's mine. I mean, it's an original. And uh, do you know since then, I've read several authors who've used that same illustration. I said, they got that from me. But apparently, you know, people have similar experiences. But here's the illustration. 
Uh, I remember when I was just a little boy, six, seven years old, we'd go over and visit my aunt, and she loved to do cross-stitching. And during those days, you'd go in the front door, and we were in what we called back then the living room. Today, it's called the family room. But we'd walk in, and my dad, would that was his sister. And I'd go in, and, and many times my aunt Naomi was sitting in her favorite chair doing that cross-stitching, and she had that cloth fabric stretched over that wooden frame. And I'm a little boy, and I'm standing on this side of her, and she's doing that work, and I'm looking at the underside of her work. And you know what I see? Knots and snarls of thread. It just didn't make any sense. It wasn't very pretty. It made no sense to me. But on occasion, my aunt would say, come over here, Rich. She called me Rich. And, and I'd go on the other side, and I'd see the finished product. Oh, how beautiful. You see, that's a great analogy of our life sometimes. We don't see things from God's eye. We're looking at things from a human perspective. We're not, we can't claim to understand all things. I can't explain to you why the Bahamas, that, that hur hurricane sat over the Bahamas so long. I mean, and one of those islands, if you saw the pictures this week, it looked like, looked like someone took a butter knife and just shaved the ground. I mean, all, everything was destroyed. I don't understand that. Was it in God's plan? Absolutely. Is God in control? Absolutely. I can't understand it, but God ultimately is going to make something beautiful out of that. He had a divine purpose for it. We need to remember that. One day, guys, we're going to see the finished product. And there's going to be great worship, great rejoicing in the Lord. And we'll understand some things we don't understand today. So in the meantime, we need to be patient with each other. You need to be patient with me. I'm going to preach mediocre sermons a lot of times. And I'm going to disappoint you in other ways. I'm human. And we need to be patient with each other. And remember that God's not finished with us. We're in that process of being made perfect. But we're in the process, so be patient. The second thing is we need to have faith in the sovereign God that we love and know. Trust Him. Doesn't mean we have to understand, but let's have faith in Him. Even when we're suffering extreme pain and loss, we have a promise from God that it is ultimately being done for our good and His glory. So the right response, even when we're frustrated, is a joy-filled faith. So let's learn to enjoy what God has given us and even enjoy the mystery because there is sometimes it is a mystery to us. The disciples often had many questions to Jesus. They spent a lot of time with him. You remember the time after Jesus Resurrection, the time between his resurrection and ascension. And the, he spent a lot of time with the disciples. And the disciples asked on one occasion, uh, what, when will it happen? When will you come back? When will we know? What, when will that great day be? And Jesus said to the disciples, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his authority. So, yet we do not know what God's promised. We know he's promised that ultimately it will be good. He's promised that his plans he's made for us are to prosper us and their plans to do good, Jeremiah. And I think Paul probably had Jeremiah on his mind when he wrote the famous scripture in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So let's humbly embrace the beauty of God's comprehensive control over our lives. And secondly, under the sunlight of this sovereignty, believing this, we should be holy and happy. Look at verse 12 and 13 again. I perceive there is nothing better for them than to be joyful 
and to do good as long as they live. And 13, that everyone should eat, drink, and take pleasure in all his toil, for this too is, or this is, God's gift to man. So now Solomon directs our attention to the related topic of, as we trust in God's sovereign control, we can now be holy and happy. There's nothing better, Solomon says, than to be joyful and to do good. Let me take these in reverse. This, this one about to do good. The word holy is derived from that imperative, do good. Let's be holy in light of who God is and what he's called us to be. Let's be holy. It's to be understood, see, in a moral and ethical sense. See, there's two ways to look at this. Holy in the moral sense that God is holy. And He has called us to be holy. He's revealed Himself as a holy God. He's revealed His moral character to us in written words like the Ten Commandments. We're to be holy because God is holy. That's the, ethical, the, that's the moral sense. The ethical sense is that that holiness translates into life change in practical ways. So I look at the needs of others and I put the needs of others before my needs. And we have opportunities to do that all the time. We just need to pay attention. A lot of times it's within our family, within our household. Let's think of our spouses before we think of what we want. Let's think of the children before we put ourselves first. Let's put others first. Friday night we went out to dinner with took the grandsons out to dinner and it was you know it was hot and we we went to uh, old charlie's and had some dinner and we were coming out we had come met there in two different cars and as we came out the front door i looked down to the far end of the parking lot and there's this lady out in the heat there in the parking lot trying to change a flat tire and i said carl you take the boys and go on home i'm gonna help this lady and it it wasn't didn't take me very long, but she needed help. Now, I had to shower again when I got home. But, you know, that's just an example of putting the needs of others first. I'm not trying to say, I, oh, I'm an exceptional man. Most any guy in this room, I hope, would have done the same thing for a woman who was trying to change a flat tire. But I, that's just one small example of putting other people before what we feel like we need to do. What I really wanted to do was get home, get these kids out of the heat, give them their baths so we could rest in the cool air, the air conditioning. But God had other plans for us. So, holy has the aspect, holiness has the aspect, the moral aspect and the ethical, which relates to our relationship with our fellow human beings. Now, let's look at this word happy. It's derived from the imperative, be joyful, happy. See, the concept of God's sovereignty flows from everything else that is said in verses 10 through 15. And here we find an imperative to be joyful, to be happy. God has ordained what's come to pass. So we can be happy. Some Christians question the need for, you know, if God is in control of all things, then why do we need to strive to be holy or to be joyful? Well, they might say if God has ordained everything to come to pass by the most wise and holy counsel of his will, then what will be will be. What's going to happen is just going to happen. We don't need to make any effort. God's already done it. Well, that's a contradiction to our understanding of God's sovereignty, plus a misunderstanding of the imperatives found in the Word of God for our lives. You see, the, for example, if God has foreordained everything, why do we need to witness to the lost? Let me give you the short answer. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. It's in God's plan that the lost will come to know Christ by the witness of his people. We're commanded to go out into 
our communities and the neighboring communities around the world and share the gospel. We need to verbalize the gospel with people. Or why do we strive for holiness? If God determined all things, well, once again, we're commanded to strive toward holiness. Romans 12, 1, you know that passage. I appeal to you, brothers, beseech you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your, your spiritual worship. So what about joyfulness? Well, I would argue that acknowledging the sovereignty of God becomes the true foundation of our joy. We can be joyful because God is a sovereign God. We should be happy. We should be holy. So rejoice in the Lord. Obey the Lord. Obey His commands. Do good to others, even to those who would seek to harm you. Enjoy good food, whether it's a T-bone or Chick-fil-A. Enjoy it. Enjoy a glass of good wine if you can you enjoy it in moderation. And smile. God does love you. And you know what? I was reminded this weekend, as the boys spent Friday and Saturday with us. Uh, you know, we need to whistle. You ever, any of you whistlers? You love to whistle? My little five-year-old grandson, he just, he's caught, caught this whistling thing. He just loves to whistle. And Friday night, Saturday, I'd be upstairs. I could hear him downstairs just whistling away. Saturday morning, Bailey was just whistling away. All kind of little tunes. He'd just be by himself sitting in a chair playing something, whistling away. You know, I told Carla later, you know, I just love to hear that. I love to hear him whistle. It, it it tells me, here's a happy child. Well, we ought to express ourselves. Let's be happy. Show people that we're, 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 we're loved. We know we're loved. We're safe because we're held in the hands of God. And then thirdly and finally, because of God's enduring, complete, and just providence, another concept of his sovereignty. Solomon says we should fear God. I perceive, he said, that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has done it. So let's fear that man may, what? Fear before him. He continues in verse 15, and God seeks what has been driven away or what has been pursued. Let me address verse 15 first, because this verse is, is, is not an easy verse to translate or to interpret. It's not an easy verse for Hebrew scholars to even translate into our English. The sense seems to be that the way, God, it, the way in which God controls all of time, that history is his story, that God is going to, you can be certain, in the end, He's going to balance the scales of justice. Man may be pursuing it, but often we fail. But God, in the end, will balance the scales of justice. We can be sure of that. See, we, we have to remember that God doesn't settle accounts, all accounts, every day. But we can also be sure that all accounts will ultimately be settled. He has done it, verse 14, back to verse 14, so that people fear before him. Now, guys, this fear of the Lord is an important concept because it's, if you read the wisdom literatures, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, and Proverbs, and Song of Songs, you'll find this concept of the fear of the Lord mentioned numerous times. Like Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What does it mean for the believer to fear the Lord? I've always taught that it meant to have a reverent awe of God. I've taught that simple definition for years, a reverent awe of God. 
It wasn't until I was studying Ecclesiastes and one of the resources uh, on Ecclesiastes written by Douglas O'Donnell that he, he helped broaden my understanding of the fear of the Lord. He summarized the fear of the Lord, this concept of our, the believer's fear of the Lord this way. Trembling trust. You see what he's done? What, he, what, what O'Donnell does is help us bring back in this aspect of this uh, God who is terrific. A derivative of terrible. But God is terrific. And we should, there should be an element of not simply just the awe of God. If we leave out the fear of God, we more or less neuter our understanding of the complete fear of God. And, and I argue it this way, guys. Think about the biblical characters that we've read about who saw God or manifestation of God. For example, Isaiah 6.6 6 was the first one that came to my mind. Remember when Isaiah saw God? He was given a vision of God's throne room. And the seraphim were around the throne of God. Remember the description of the seraphim? The seraphim had six wings. Two, each, two wings to cover their eyes. Two wings to cover their feet. And the other two wings so that they might move about. But even the seraphim were trying to hide themselves from the majestic glory of God. They had an understanding of a, the fear of God in His majesty and holiness. And when Isaiah saw the throne room of God, do you know what he said? Do you remember his response? Woe is me. It's like saying, it's, I'm done for. It's over. I'll never live beyond this experience. Woe is me, he said. And then he goes on to say, I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. He, he, he in understanding, just getting a glimpse of the holiness of God, he truly understood his own depravity and how ugly Sin is. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell with people of unclean lips. Peter, in a whole different setting, Jesus was in the boat with Peter fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter was brought in his net and there was hardly anything in it. And Jesus said, cast over here. Peter doubted, but he did it anyway. And you remember what happened? The net was so full of fish that he hardly got it back into the boat. But when that happened, Peter recognized who Jesus really was. And the Bible says that he fell upon the knees of Jesus. And he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. So here is this aspect of a proper fear of God brought into our understanding. It's not just an a reverent awe of God, but there's this trembling trust that God is God, not us. Let's remember that. I'll close with this short story. You remember this if you saw the movie Titanic. You remember at one point in the movie one evening that Jack, who was played by Leonardo Di DiCaprio, Jack goes out on the bow, the very tip of this magnificent vessel, the unsinkable ship. Remember, he climbs up on the point of the bow and he holds his hands up in the air and he beats his chest and that cold Atlantic air is blowing in his face as that unsinkable ship is steaming across the North Atlantic at full speed headed toward that iceberg he pounds his chest and Jack says, I'm the king of the world. Remember that scene? Just a few scenes later, Jack isn't claiming omnipotence. He's hanging on for dear life in the cold Atlantic as that ship breaks in half. 
and sinks to a watery grave. And then moments later, Jack himself slips into the depths of the ocean to his cold, dark grave. And my, my question for all of us is this morning, do you really have a trembling trust that God is the king of all kings? He's the ruler of all. Can you trust in him that he rules the universe, that the whole earth indeed is full of his glory, and that the right response to us should be worship, a hunger to be like him to be holy, to worship God, to not forsake the assembling of the people of God, and to worship God during the week, to be holy during the week, and to be joyful. Let me close with this reading of Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. I want you to bow your heads now because we're going to prepare for communion. I want to read as the elders come and take their place. I want to read these verses. As you contemplate these words of truth written by the Apostle Paul. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Father, we want to make that our prayer today. How inscrutable are your ways. How unsearchable are your judgments. We can't know your mind, Lord. We can't repay you for what you've done for us through Christ. Help us to understand that indeed from you and through you and to you are all things. And may our lives be lived in a way that glorifies you that others are attracted to you because they see something different in us. They might be attracted to you through our joyfulness, whistling a tune, our trembling trust that you are God and we are not. We thank you this morning for the table set before us and how it reminds us in such a dramatic way that you love us and that you reside with us. You'll never forsake us. And Lord, I know there are many here this morning who need a fresh embrace like a father or a grandfather would embrace a child or grandchild and hold him or her close. As we take the elements today, would you embrace us and hold us close, remind us that we belong to you and that we are safe. And we thank you, Father, that you sent your son Christ to take our sins upon himself and he paid our debt, a debt we owed but couldn't pay. And that we have been accounted righteous.
even though we're so sinful. We stand righteous before you. That's amazing grace, Father. So we take this joyfully this morning. Giving thanks for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I do remind you that we celebrate an open communion here at Hope. And you don't have to be a member of this church. But if you're a member of the family of God, you can enjoy this with us. The scripture says on the night that Jesus met with his disciples, they were having the Passover meal. Actually, it was a Thursday night. It was just hours before Jesus would be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. After they'd eaten together, the scripture says that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat from this, for this is my body given for you. After they had broken bread together, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks for it, and offered it to his disciples and said to them, Drink from it, for this is the blood of my body. It's poured out for the forgiveness of sins. His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Our worship team is going to come and take their place. And we'll close with a song together. In fact, that's what the disciples did after they had the supper together. They sang together. Not sure what they sang, but they worshiped. Let's stand together and worship in song once again. If you have time on your way out, wish uh, Lee a happy birthday. Today he celebrates the big 7-0 today. He's, he's proud of it. <laughs> it's the truth. Hope to see you Wednesday night for dinner. In the meantime, I pray the Lord will bless you and that the grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ will go with you all. Amen. Amen.